Now, it goes without saying that the global pandemic has forced upon us radical change, causing us to exercise those muscles of innovation and adaptation in so many ways. I'm sure you agree that it's really caused the courts and law firms to innovate at an unprecedented rate. So our next panel will discuss the pros and the cons of technology and the gaps and how legal, innotech, legal tech innovators can help close them. Hi, everybody. First of all, I want to speak for the panel that I, we do not like going after Richard Susskind. You're always going to seem less interesting after Richard Susskind. And there are literally hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lawyers who would have been adequately boring beyond belief that we could have gone after. So, uh, I mean, he used the word algorithmic architecture. I don't know what that means, but it sounded beautiful. So uh, please send me the third edition, please, Richard. Um, anyway, I'm your moderator and designated cannon fodder for this next exciting segment of The Changing Lawyer with Latera. My name is Joe Borstein, CEO of LexFusion and total freak about legal innovation. Uh, in this next section, we're gonna talk about courts, litigation practice and technology post the pandemic. Uh, with Latera, I do a bi-monthly podcast where my guests and I discuss the tectonic forces bubbling under the surface of the $800 billion legal industry. I wanna get these themes out up front before I uh, introduce my guests and um, torture them on these themes and, and how they uh, tie into technology. First, we have globalization, allowing lawyers and allied professionals across the globe to collaborate seamlessly on legal work. Next, and most important to this crowd, technology is automating the routine processes of today and relentlessly crawling up the value chain of tomorrow. Legal regulation, which came up with Richard, is being questioned and changed in real time, allowing professionals outside of bar associations to work right alongside lawyers to solve legal problems at scale and for the first time ever, enjoy some of the profits of traditional legal work. Finally, outside capital is pouring in. Investors from Silicon Valley VCs to New York private equity funds to public stock offerings, which we're seeing one after another, these investors see an opportunity to make a broken legal system dramatically better. Uh, futurist Peter Diamandis likes to say, you wanna make a billion dollars, figure out how to help a billion people. Well, law affects every single person on this planet. There are so many people to help um, and there's a lot of money to make and there's a lot of good to do. So whatever drives you, idealism, greed, excitement, pay attention. I think we have the right crowd and right cross-section of the legal industry to talk about this. First, um, Jen Leonard. Jen is the chief innovation officer at Penn Law, my alma mater and officially the best law school period. Um, she leads the Future of the Profession initiative um, we're also lucky to have Rachel Dooley. She is Global Managing Counsel for McKinsey Digital. Um, she's a thought partner, a designer, a legal innovator, and she's currently leading their internal uh, digital legal transformation and, of course, their legal innovation efforts. And last but certainly not least, we have Evan Shankman, Chief Knowledge and Innovation Officer at Fisher Phillips. Uh, he practiced labor and employment law at two other top firms. Um, and ended up as an actual partner before he moved into legal innovation, an unusual path um, and one I hope we see more and more of. Um, so we're gonna start the panel today using a, a technique I learned from Jen um, called uh, a popcorn style uh, opener. Um, and we're gonna ask everybody uh, to introduce themselves, their role in legal and share a little bit about their predictions for the biggest challenge and opportunity related to legal and tech uh, over the next five years. So Evan, can we start with you? Sure. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Altera. Um, so yeah, as Joe mentioned, I'm the Chief Knowledge and Innovation Officer at Fisher Phillips. We're a, a large labor and employment law firm, um, about 500 attorneys, 34 offices, um, helping employers uh, handle all their workplace legal issues. Um, so I spend, um, I spend all my days and nights thinking about how our attorneys can, can do things better, smarter, faster using technology. Um, and one of the things that I've really been focusing on over the past few years, and especially so um, in the current uh, pandemic and uh, soon to be post pandemic era um, is predictive analytics um, augmented by AI to try to make it work well. That's what I see is, is really probably one of the greatest opportunities that we're gonna see over the next a uh, few years. Um, lots of great uh, aspects of it. 
um, that will help our lawyers, that will help our clients, that will help um, justice, that will help just the, the practice of law. Um, so super opportunities there. Um, one, uh, one thing I, I should say also, hey, I think it's also one of our problems, one of our challenges. Um, I think these predictive analytics projects um, are challenging. Um, they're not something that you can go and roll out in a couple of hours uh, or a couple of weeks. Um, they are difficult. There's no off-the-shelf solutions um, that you can just go in and run with it, at least for your internal data. Uh, but we could talk about that in a little bit. Um, and I'm excited to, uh, to be here. Awesome. And um, if we're sticking to the rules, you have to then hand it off to the next person. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump over to Rachel. Awesome. Rachel, Thanks, Kevin. Sounds great. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. I, as Joe mentioned, I lead uh, McKinsey Digital Globally from a legal perspective, which means that I am supporting the technology enabled services that come from a, a major uh, management consulting firm. And the, the landscape is constantly changing, as you might expect with emerging technology. So I support a lot of our teams doing the work that that Evan um, is speaking about that I also lights me up. Um, and then obviously trying to apply that internally from a legal perspective thoughtfully while you know getting our early adapter uh, advantage um you know i think i think from a challenges perspective in the legal industry i think that you know the the change of legal technology and sort of the innovation wave that's coming mercifully so and thankfully so i think we can all agree that we're pretty excited about what's coming mm -hmm. but it is going to change the business model of like how a lot of us grew up in the industry of you know gone are the days of many, many weeks of pouring through doc review or, or like slogging through due diligence and and that being sort of the basis on which law firms could sort of up, upskill their junior folks and also, you know, certainly kind of make sure that the that the finances worked out. So I think with legal technology helping us slough off some of that work in a great way um, that we are now opening up an opportunity for junior lawyers to come into the practice, hitting the ground running because we need to, because we need them to be operating, doing something for sure, but 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 contributing to the future of the practice. And I think ultimately it will drive us towards a place of lawyers being more than, you know, than than legal scholars and more than than sort of legal interpreters and more towards true business problem solvers. It's certainly something that we look for with our, you know, our, our counsel and what we aim to be internally from from an in-house perspective. But I think that that's where all lawyers will be going in the future. And I'm I'm really excited about it. So Jen, I will ping pong it over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rachel. Uh, thank you, Joe and Evan and Latera. I'm so excited to be here. As Joe said, my name is Jen Leonard. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer and Executive Director of the Future of the Profession Initiative at my alma mater as well, Penn Law School. Uh, I see so many challenges and opportunities on the horizon. I'll end on a positive note, so I'll start with the challenge that I see. I have the great pleasure in my role of trying to cultivate a community of people who are trying to think about innovation and trying to learn about the changing landscape. And that role includes bringing on board our students and helping them understand from the very outset of their careers where the opportunities are, why this moment's different, all of the challenges around access to justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion, attorney well-being, um, and also bringing along our alumni community, our partners, our advisory board members. And some days when I have all of these different conversations with stakeholders across the profession, I feel a little bit like that windsock mascot in front of a, a car dealership, because on the one hand, I get the opportunity to meet all these amazing students who have so much energy and so much facility with tech and are eager to really innovate and change the world. And then I've also worked in government work and I have the opportunity to work with state court judges and I know how slowly change happens at that level. And so I feel like I'm frequently moving around these conversations and the speed is so different uh, at which different groups want to move. And I think that the real challenge in that is that we're all connected and really we are all one profession and the rule of law depends on all of us moving generally in one direction. So how do we keep that conversation aligned and how do we keep the stakeholders connected at a time when it feels to me at least like we can easily become disconnected and move in different directions. On the positive front, I think there are real opportunities that the pandemic has really opened up 
for creating greater flexibility for everybody in the legal system. Um, I've, I've heard conversations with state court judges about how they are experimenting with remote hearings and allowing, for example, truck drivers in Texas who are on a long haul route call in to a hearing from a Zoom line, right, on their on their phones, and they're no longer being held in contempt or hearings, and they're able to access those services in new ways. In the same way, uh, professionals and lawyers, especially working parents, are able to engage in their profession and practice at the top end of their license while also having a full life. Before this call, I gave baths to kids, I cooked dinner, I took the dog for a walk, and I sat down and I'm still able to contribute and be included. But as we move to a phase where we're starting to get back to the irreplaceable parts of being together, how do we retain some of those good things from the virtual world and recognize that there are proximity and affinity biases that can um, upend some of those great benefits of flexibility. So uh, I'm really excited for the future and really excited for this conversation. And I am going to toss it to Joe to finalize our pop popcorn. Wow. Round. <laughs> okay, that was that was a tough act to follow. Uh, you use the imagery of wind socks at car dealers, um, <laughs> which I, I, I think rivaled you know anything we heard on the last panel. So that was great. So. Um, Man, opportunities and challenges. Uh, anyone who knows me knows that I, I am a, a, a very much a glasses half full person. Um, I think, uh, I think that um, the this technological and globalization and deregulatory wave, which you know, I think it's all of those things, is really going to be a benefit to to, to almost everybody, um, except for people that hate change. So I think it is going to grow the pie. I think there's really good research. Um, and, and evidence behind the idea that it is not going to steamroll lawyers, it is going to empower lawyers to do more. It's going to bring a tremendous amount of demand out of the woodwork, uh, both from both from uh, you know more idealistic uh, access to justice point of view. I think a lot of people uh, further down the income levels will, will, will be able to access algorithms that will allow them to access their rights. But I also think um, people will simply ask for more advice. I think that they're um, almost anybody that's launched a small business uh, has had the experience of simply not getting the legal advice that they want because it, it, it is priced out and not even the most routine parts are automated. I guess um, uh, if, the, if, if there were a, a challenge to come out of this, I see the biggest challenge is change management. We are a, an industry that rightfully um, is based on precedent. Uh, and and I, I think in the area of the law, that, that is a, a phenomenal thing and a stabilizing force uh, in the area of innovation that can obviously hold us back. Now, we, you know, we, we, we don't want to change as fast as uh, social media, right? We don't want to move fast and break things um, because the things we're breaking are, are incredibly precious and important. But, but we do have to embrace the phenomenal technologies, the, the globalized world that we have um, and and business models that have been proven all over the world. And I think if if we're willing to embrace those things, I think uh, lawyers are going to see unbelievable opportunity to either practice law and use amazing tools like, like Latera has, um, or create businesses that solve legal problems at scale through C corporations or other different models and um, enjoy the, the, the modern ability to um, solve a problem once and replicate it millions of times. That's a beautiful thing. And we really haven't seen that in legal yet. Uh, you know, I know Clio won the Lifetime Achievement Award and, and, and I'm, I, I was really happy to see that. And I think it's incredibly well-deserved um, because I, I think they were one of the first players outside of eDiscovery um, to, to, to replicate uh, solutions for law firms at unbelievable scale in a way that's cost-effective and awesome. So. Anyway, I just talked a lot. Let's go back to Evan. Um, Evan, you kicked us off. One of your opportunities is um, how we can, it, this is more about like the, the core practice of law, which we all know needs to improve uh, as well. And, and you touched on predictive analytics um, and data analytics. Let's dig in there. What's, what is that opportunity? What do you see uh, in your daily practice? And then I, I'd love to hear from Rachel and Jen. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, I, I think it's huge. And, and one of the best ways I could sort of tee this off is to, to share one of my favorite anecdotes. And it's it's not from legal, um, but someone who was putting together an app that was to be used for, um, for entities that were deciding whether or not to give loans to people. Um, I think it's an app called Lendo. And essentially what they did is they looked at a whole bunch of data points 
um, about the credit history and about the age and about their financial information and about all this stuff. Um, and one of the, the greatest predictors of whether or not someone would default on a loan or pay their loan back on time happened to be, because uh, this, this was a cell phone app, it happened to be the battery charge level of the cell phone when the person was applying for that loan, right? So if the battery was, you know, 10% left on the charge when they hit, we want a loan versus 99%, that was a great, great predictor of whether or not it was a good loan to, to offer. And that sort of thing, you know, it makes sense, I guess, because those sort of people are um, more responsible. They're, you know, they're, you know, belt and suspenders kind of people. They're, they make sure they charge their phone multiple times during the day. They're probably more likely to pay a loan. But that's not something that you would think of when you're trying to figure out who you should give money to. You're not thinking about, hey, what's your cell phone charge? And that, that sort of thing, it really resonates with me because that's what we're trying to do and we're looking to do with the practice of law. We have so many data points um, as a law firm that handles thousands and thousands of thousands of cases um, for, for many, many, many years. We have data points about all of our financial information, about you know, when certain aspects of cases heat up, uh, which judges, which opposing counsel, which causes of action, um, which aspects of which causes of action tend to be more or less problematic. Um, we have so many data points there um, that for years have gone untapped, but now the technology is there not only to start tapping it um, if it's, it's nice and structured, um, but also the technology is there to start to use AI to pull out the data points, even if it's unstructured. And once you could start to do that, once you could start to point a robot at all of your prior work product, all of your financial information, all of the external information from various legal research providers that, that offer APIs, pull that all together into one big database, you can do some fantastic things to try to figure out it's which really cases exciting. are more, more or less likely to resolve at various stages, depending on who the attorneys are, who the client is, who the judge is, what venue, what month it is, what, you know, what everything about the case. Um, and that sort of information is, from my perspective, key to allowing attorneys to give much better predictions to our clients. And our clients are just thrilled when you could do a better job letting them know how much a case will cost, how long it will last, what we think is likely to happen, whether or not we should move to, to you know, change venue if we can, and, and a whole host of things. The predictability about finances are huge. Um, I just see such a great value in this. And now that we're working on these projects, um, we're starting to see the benefits and clients are, are thrilled with it and prospects love the fact that we're doing this. And I just see it as something that has uh, such great value. We want to find that you know, cell phone charge level uh, that worked for low-end folks. Uh, we're looking to find that for law and uh, we're starting to find it. And it's pretty exciting stuff. I, I love that. And I think it, 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 it dovetails really well with, with Rachel's opening point about uh, moving to a place where lawyers are, are, are true business problem solvers. Um, so uh, can I hand it to Rachel? I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, obviously, McKinsey has a lot to say about data. Um, uh, <laughs> indeed. Um, about, you know, how, how you're thinking about uh, way, ways to apply uh, uh, similar large data sets and technology. Yeah, I, I yeah, I have I have a, I have a lot of thoughts. I mean, I, I'm I'm with Evan um, certainly on kind of the potential and the utility and just what a big opportunity is for the for the industry. I would layer on top of that that I think it's it's a particularly interesting opportunity for the industry when we think about like from a diversity and inclusivity perspective, simply from the from sort of the basic standard that you know analytics are. A, it, it is a it is a bias exercise, right? You you are taking data and you're leveraging it to make predictions about the future. Like that, there is no such thing as a completely unbiased approach within analytics. What you're looking for is unintentional bias and and really solving for that and solving for the fairness that comes with you know bias that you think is that that you you've sort of rigorously tested um, for impact and bias on certainly on on different classes and different. Um, different cuts of the population. So I think there is a big opportunity for our industry in thinking through both from a private sector perspective, but certainly when it comes to the courts and we think about how we might, you know, support as an industry leveraging technology, we're going to need a lot of really smart minds coming from lots of different angles to be rigorously thinking through, you know, what is the technology that we're choosing? How are we implementing it? What are the data sets that we're, test that we're testing on and training on? And how are we kind of leveraging the right data to put through that? And it's, you know, it's obviously something that 
that when you're working in the AI field, it's those are those are continuous conversations. And I think admittedly, you know, we get smarter as we go on and as the analytics get smarter and more and more sophisticated and more powerful. And so we need to, as practitioners, need to continuously be up to speed on how we how we run at pace with that. So it's a great opportunity. And, and like I said at the beginning, a great opportunity for for junior folks coming into the practice to really get involved in how we shape the future, because you know, starting and kicking off technology now and leveraging technology now, like this is, this is the impact point, right? This is where we start the training. This is where we start the trajectory. This is where we can really make significant impact for future generations. So I hope that, you know, I'm, I'm a technology lawyer. So I sit and preach all day long about like, please come and, you know, you're in, you're in the legal field, read up a little bit on technology. There's aren't that many people doing it. Like come join the, come join the bandwagon Evan and I will happily like sit down and you know preach to you about why this is why this is so useful to be a part of the future here because it just it will really be an important inflection point for our practice. I love it. I love it. Um, Jen, uh, I, I was hoping to turn to you and 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 feel free to to chime in on data analytics, data data analytics as well. Um, but uh, but but I made a point about moving fast and breaking things and how. Uh, legal tech should move faster, but but you know the, the, there there is kind of there is a too fast. Um, uh, unlike many other industries where it's okay to make uh, you know a mediocre product, right? It's not okay. Um, what can we learn from other disciplines uh, where where there have been histories of strong innovation? Yeah, the the only point I'll add on data analytics relates back to what we discussed at the beginning, which is keeping these conversations connected, because I think there's so much potential in the tools that Evan and Rachel are talking about. But I would venture to guess that most state court judges are not familiar with these tools, are not aware of some of the intended and unintended consequences that might flow from those tools. And the thing that concerns me is I don't see right now an incentive to keep those conversations aligned. So how do we think about creating incentives to keep that communication uh, flowing back and forth? Because I could also see a world in which judges are very used to calling balls and strikes as they see them on individual cases. But if they start to become aware of trends in their own rulings, are they self-correcting based on those data analytics and coming out with different results than they would have if they were just looking at a case with fresh eyes? Do we want that? If we do, then how do we make that happen more and communicate more with judges about the technology and what lawyers are seeing? If we don't, then how do we adjust and make sure, again, that everybody's part of the same discussion as we roll out this technology? And on the move fast and break things point, I think it's a, an exceptional point. And I actually teach this to my students, the difference between really quality innovation and terrible innovation, <laughs> in which unintended consequences that we're all now living through flow. And the move fast and break things tagline to me just embodies poor innovation. And what anybody around the, the campus that I get to spend my days at would tell you is that innovation really requires two things. One is inspiration and the second is constraint. And I think the second piece is where lawyers can really shine, right? We can spot the issues, we can spot the constraints and we can help craft a solution that is narrowly tailored and thinks through as many unintended consequences as we can imagine. I think the piece that sometimes we're missing is the first piece, is the inspiration piece. And I think the way that we find more inspiration is opening up this conversation to make it more multidisciplinary. When I took on the role I have now, I started traveling around Penn's campus and meeting with people from medicine and nursing and engineering and Wharton and education and all sorts of parts of my brain that had been dormant started mm -hmm. lighting up with new ideas. You know, somebody said to me, why don't we have a screen in a courthouse that mimics the arrivals and departures screen at an airport so people can easily find a courtroom when they go into a courthouse? We don't think about that because we're not opening ourselves up to curiosity, asking why we do things the way they do and find inspiration in unusual places. So I think that if we can solve for that first piece, we actually bring to the innovation conversation a lot of skills that will result in strong innovation. I love it. And 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 look, then that's a, a perfect transition to, to the next issue. I wanted to, to ask the panel. Um, you mentioned a lot about courts uh, not necessarily you know, being as up to date. You have a lot more monetary incentives, frankly, in, 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 in large law firms and large corporations to uh, get the work done better, cheaper, faster. 
um, uh, in, in courts, you, you have less of them and, and people don't know how to get ideas into the courts, uh, which brings us back to, you know, my original topic, change management. How, how, how do we get people to use stuff that's already there? Um, uh, you know, even, even things like Microsoft Word um, and, and, and the basic Microsoft suite, which every lawyer has, there, there's uh, a, a dramatic lack of understanding of, of all the features and functionality baked in. Evan, let, let's start with you. You know, you run innovation for, for, for a world's great law firm. Um, how do we get past this change management issue? It's, it's, a, it's a huge um, thing to focus on, I think, for anyone in, in a role like mine. Um, we don't wanna just you know, buy things that we think are cool and then have them become shelfware. Right. Um, but what's, what's really been a driver for me and something I think um, should be a driver for anyone um, working in a camera innovation function in a law firm is it's what our clients want. It's what our prospects want now. Um, I review a whole bunch of, of requests for proposal for RFPs um, where we're trying I'm to, sorry. pardon me? I said, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, you know, it happens. It's part of the job um, cool. where, where we're trying to, to get work from an employer. Um, we're trying to handle their litigation, whether it's a single litigation or all their litigation across the country. And over the past year or so, um, I've re reviewed these RFPs and about two thirds of them are explicitly asking now questions about how we use data analytics to make stronger predictions. How are we using artificial intelligence? Tell us how you're sharing knowledge. What is your, uh, what is your plan for sharing, uh, sharing knowledge across various offices so you're all in sync and so on? Um, these sort of questions were never asked before, you know, maybe three, four years ago. And the fact that they're being asked now, um, when we show our attorneys that, hey, these are the things that the clients are asking for, they care about this, they get this, they understand it, they expect for our firm to be bought into these, uh, these new ways of practicing law, um, that opens their eyes. Right. They, they certainly realize when it when it is the decision um, to either get that business, not that get get that business, <laughs> they will support these initiatives. Um, one other sort of anecdote I'll, I'll point out um, in terms of data analytics in today's day and age. Um, we we did a, a number of things during the pandemic to try to um, to help the general public, to, to let people know um where the problem areas were with, with COVID-19 with regard to the employer-employee relationship. Uh, and that included rolling out a COVID-19 employment litigation tracker. We rolled it out really early on in the pandemic. We wanted to give employers a chance to know um, which regions were more or less problematic from, from a lawsuit perspective, which causes of action, what industries were getting hit more, what employer size, uh, what the claims were, uh, and where, why it was trending better, worse, and so on. So we put this on our website. Um, hit launch, uh, thought it would be helpful, interesting, and so on. Um, but within a matter of days, it, it went viral. It became the top hit back then, and it still is today on Google for COVID-19 employment litigation. So you know, data analytics is, is still, and it has been for over a year, the number one thing that people go to and find awesome. about COVID uh, employment litigation, which never would have thought it was going to happen. But hey, it's, you know, Forbes covered it, Newsweek, CNN. It's, it's now what employers care about and employers are clients. Um, and when you can show your law firm how valuable data analytics, artificial intelligence, KM initiatives are um, by showing examples like this, showing what the clients are clicking on, showing what they're asking for, showing what they want to talk about, um, that makes the change management challenge um, something that is is much easier to, uh, to uh, handle. Yeah, no, that's that's incredible. I mean, and 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 essentially, you solved the legal problem at scale, right? You you were able to you know publish to the market uh, questions that millions of people were asking at once. I think that that, that, that that's a, a beautiful example. Um, Rachel, uh, I, I got to turn to you next. Uh, I, I I love that in this panel we have all the people I would turn to next. Anyway. Um, McKinsey, obviously change management, a big deal. Like, you know, you work in the legal department, but but change in the future is something that McKinsey is constantly looking at. Like, uh, how do you look at the, the legal economy and the legal world um, and think about how to get this, you know, I think unique um, constituency to move into the future? Totally. Yeah. It, well, and I, I might be a little disappointing here. I might go a little low tech, low brow, I suppose. Um, 
I, 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 as you know, um, I spent about seven years outside of, I left the legal profession for about seven years to run a fashion business and did the fashion week circuit. And I have all the love for the fashion industry, but I, the, one of the, the biggest lessons that I port back to my profession now is just how much packaging matters, right? I think that it just, the way that you can tell the story, the way that you can really, you need to distill, distill, distill down the message of the why, right? And I think you could, back to your point, Joe, of you could have the best tech. Someone could be rolling out and, you know, I look at it many times a week and we, we think about like, what is the best? What is the best? What is the most cutting edge for what's coming in the legal industry? But the truth is, if you can't get adoption and you can't really sell the clear, what is the problem that we're trying to solve for, like, and, and sell that to the folks who need to hear it, it's probably going to fail no matter what you do, right? And, and there is a there was a study um, or a, a survey, I suppose, that that McKinsey did a number of years ago on digital transformations. That that three quarters of all digital transformations fail, and and one of the largest reasons for that is that the change management is missing. That wow. the storyline from the very beginning is missing, um, and that's either for sort of like getting off the ground, it doesn't work, or over time the sustained change doesn't stick. Um, so I would say in the profession, really, you know, from a legal perspective. What I'm currently focused on for our, you know, for our professionals and where we could maybe excel in that space is storytelling and really thinking about, you know, we have amazing analytical thinkers and you, you know, you get folks out of law school ready, you know, Jen, thankfully, like gets them ready to run at the innovation. But how do they tell the story to the partners? How do they tell the story to the clients? What is the what is the solution? I think it's I think there is a huge lift in us all kind of focusing on, okay, like truly focusing, there are simple tools. Let's get those done. Let's get some quick wins and some low hanging fruit and then go on to the bigger, more complex, you know, issues after we've got our sea legs about it. I, I think there are some quick wins, but it takes a lot of diligence and practice to really execute on those quick wins too. So I think it's, like I said, it's a little, a little low tech, but I think it's really impactful. No, I think it's incredible. Obviously, you know, Lex Fusion is a business that, that that looks to grease the gears of commerce and legal innovation. One of the things we listen for when we show somebody a new tool or a new service is whether they say, um, this is something we should be using or this is something I would like to use. Um, it, it, until somebody internalizes how it can make their own lives better, um, you're, you're basically still nowhere. So that, that, that's really interesting. And value storytelling is unbelievably important. Uh, packaging matters. I, I love it. Um, Jen, uh, we actually we actually are, are, are running a, a bit out of time, but um, I, I think the ultimate agent of change are the law schools. You are the first step into the career. So no pressure, but how are you going to change the whole industry for the better? <laughs> that that is a big question. Um, I I was actually going to build on Rachel's point for just a second and represent the government yeah. uh, courts perspective. I'm I'm closing my door as my child is coming in. I'm sorry. Um, and just say that the other piece of the equation is the story to whom the people uh, the people to whom the story is being told as well, and making sure that they're educated about the tech that they're they're being talked to about. What I saw in government work was that frequently. Um, vendors would come in with technology that sounded incredible. It sounded like it was perfectly tailored for this unique situation in Philadelphia for this particular constituency. But the problem was that it was so bespoke that it required an ongoing relationship with just that vendor. Uh, and to Evan's point, there may have been cheaper, more efficient off the shelf solutions that could have helped keep the city more connected in an ongoing basis with a larger company or with somebody who would be able to help them adapt in the future. And instead, you you get stuck with legacy systems. And it goes back to that that point about keeping everybody connected. If, if everybody else is moving on to new things and we're stuck in the past, that's a problem. Um, I would say change management for the future of the profession. I think that the the Great news is that they are ready to change with us. <laughs> they are all about it. They see the issues. They understand the tech. They are eager and willing to contribute. The challenge, I think, for us in the profession is to find appropriate ways to help them leverage their interest and creativity. And I think it's a real opportunity for law firms who are in a huge war for talent at the moment uh, to find really creative ways to help new associates learn creativity and innovation uh, and become more deeply engaged in the firm. And I'm going to mute myself now, but this was <laughs> very, very fun. To well, it, 
it's good to get you know the, the the point of view of the next next generation of lawyers. So thanks thanks for including your children. Um, we are pretty much out of time. Um, Evan, Rachel, do you want to get in any last words? I, I will add a plug again. I will double down on this plug. But for all of all of sort of the folks with their fingers in the next generation of the legal industry listening to this, I think I think there was this there used to be this sort of mental barrier and maybe it was, it was an actual barrier that turned into a mental barrier, but like of, of legal professionals who wanted to get in on the technology side that you needed some sort of magic key. You needed a technical background. You needed sort of an invitation. And I, I hope that what some of what you're hearing here is that it is, it is good to get engaged and it's good to sort of foster the next generation of folks who may have no idea what AI is, but it's not, there, there isn't all that heavy of a lift to start getting in on the conversation, start being part of the thinking through the next generation of solutions. I would really, as someone who is constantly looking for legal <laughs> legal tech talent, um, that I know that the pool is still more much more shallow than it should be. And I think that we are going to need a lot of really great minds to continue to, to think this all through thoughtfully. So I would just um, put in another hammer that home of, I think, if you can get your folks excited about engaging in these conversations, I, my, my door is always open to those conversations. I think, I think we have a great, you know, that we have a great future in the profession, but we're going to need lots of folks to engage. Yeah. And one thing I'll say just to, to jump off of what Rachel said, um, just like there's really no magic key to get into this industry. Um, when you're here in a law firm and you're working or law firm or an in-house team or whatever, um, and you're working on these innovation products, there's also no magic wallet that you need. Some of the things that we've done that have been tremendously successful, innovative, whatever, cost our firm nothing. Um, you could do them with you know, Power BI that you probably already have for free under your Microsoft account. Um, you could do innovative things with, with SharePoint. Um, you don't need to go and spend um, hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop some AI thing in-house. You could partner with vendors who will spends all their time and R&D and R &D, um, to work with you because they're thrilled to work with you to help build something that you could help sort of direct. So don't think that getting in the innovation game requires an extraordinary investment in, in money. Um, time investment sometimes, yes, but money not always. So don't let that be a deterrent. Um, and just reach out to any of us, reach out to anyone in the community. A lot of uh, law firms have done really cool things and they love to talk about what worked, what didn't work. Um, reach out to us. Awesome. Awesome. So I want to thank everybody. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Evan. I want to just say a few words summing up. I think we all agree the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. Um, change management matters. Packaging matters. And it doesn't necessarily have to all, be all that expensive. As an industry, we do not want to be one of those used car sock men. We need to be coordinated and marching in step, at least, uh, uh, you know, at least not totally flailing. And finally, never, ever, ever run a panel right after Richard Suskin. Thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of, of your night with LaTerra. Thanks for having us.